Okay, um, bon voyage, um, break a leg. <laughs> All right, hello everyone that's joining us from Zoom. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so pleased to be here with you tonight for this special discussion of Kate Holden's book, The Winter Road, in conversation with Christine Jack Jackman. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am currently on, the Yogara and Turrbal people, as well as the traditional owners of the land on which you're all joining us from. I pay my respects to elders past and present. Sovereignty has never been ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. For our audience tonight, you will be muted for the session, but if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box. I'm just about to send through a link to purchase Kate's book um, into the chat box, so you can order her book online and then also see how the chat function works. Um, and then around 7.15 tonight, towards the close of the discussion, we'll host a quick Q&A, so please type questions into the chat box at any time, and then I'll pass them on to Kate and Christine. It's now my pleasure to introduce our conversation partner for tonight, Christine Jackman. Christine is an award-winning journalist and author who has worked in New York as a foreign correspondent and in the Canberra Press Gallery. Her latest book, Turning Down the Noise, was published last year. It details her personal journey in search of silence and better health in an increasingly busy world. Take it away, Christine. <laughs> Thanks, Shanna, and welcome everybody, and welcome, Kate. I will do the honours just very quickly. Um, giving you a little bit of background information to Kate Holden. Um, she is the author of two acclaimed memoirs, In My Skin and The Romantic. She's also a regular contributor to the Saturday paper, to The Monthly and The Age. Um, and welcome, Kate. Thank you. So, so exciting. Um, as I was saying, everybody, just before we came online, um, I just vividly remembering Kate's first memoir. I remember reading Kate's first memoir um, in my skin and just the vivid writing. Um, I can remember. I can remember parts of it clearly, mm -hmm. which is really unusual. Very few, few books, I, I think, stay with you through children and yeah. life. <laughs> Nigh on 15, 16 years. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> and I know you've, um, I mean, I've fo certainly followed your work, um, particularly writing with the Saturday paper and everything, but this is such a, an interesting and unexpected <laughs> book to, to, come, to um, come out in your name. So I am thrilled uh, mm -hmm. that I had a chance to receive a preview copy. And so let's get started. and. Um, talk about that, talk about how it came to be. Um, I think every, maybe most people in the room tonight will vaguely recall, as I did, the news of the shooting of a, of a government officer by an elderly farmer in New South Wales in 2014. It, 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 I remember hearing that and just thinking that's such an unusual thing to happen, such a tragic thing, the age, the people in the age of the farmer, the people involved. And my journalist's radar went on a bit just because it's one of those uh, news events that you think there has got to be more to this story. So, Kate, okay, can you just take us to what happened that night on that sort of lonely road um, in June 2014? Yeah, well, I remember. I remember hearing the news. I think most people in Australia were, were deeply shocked when Glenn Turner was murdered by Ian Turnbull. Um, Glenn was a, an environmental compliance officer who was working for the Office of Environment and Heritage in New South Wales, and his job was, um, you know, a, a pretty basically routine job. Um, mostly, I, I believe, it involved going out and having a chat with people, you know, reminding them of the laws, occasionally being involved in investigations and prosecutions, preparing prosecutions. Um, you know, he was, he was a, a lovely guy, apparently, um, a family man, uh, and he was on his way to, um, well, he was, he was involved in an investigation of Ian Turnbull and the Turnbull family. Now, the Turnbulls were um, a family up in the Cropper Creek, which is near Moree, near the border with Queensland in northern, northwest New South Wales, and they'd been there for a while. They're a property developing family um, with farming uh, is their background. They've, you know, made a lot of money through developing and converting land from grazing to cropping. This is big business up that way. Mm -hmm. um, it's some of the richest agricultural country in the, in the continent. And um, they weren't the only ones doing this, but they were the ones who ch chose to buy two blocks. These were blocks of land which had been left undeveloped 
in this area, which is otherwise quite well cleared. Um, and these blocks are covered with a, a species um, called brigolo and other native vegetation, um, which meant that because brigolo is a nitrogen fixing plant, mm. um, the soil underneath the scrub there was incredibly valuable if you could get to it. Now, everyone in that area knew that you'd never be able to get permission to clear those blocks because it was very likely to be covered in endangered species. There were koalas seen around there. There were other, you know, endangered vegetation species. The Turnbulls bought the blocks and um, decided to proceed with clearing, even though they had not yet been given permission. Um, and indeed, they, they were never given permission. And so they, they were warned, weren't they, they were before they bought yeah. them? They, yeah, yeah, they were. And... Um, I guess um, on reflection, it's very likely that they took a calculated risk. Um, so Glenn was brought in to investigate. It's quite early on, in fact, before the Turnbulls had even finished the sale. You know, the flags went up. There might be um, something to watch here. Uh, so he was involved in, a, a, well, about two years worth of investigations in which he repeatedly contacted the Turnbulls and reminded them um, of the situation. Uh, he was... Um, involved in a scene, an incident where Ian Turnbull um, allegedly threatened Glenn's life mm. um, and said, if you value your life, you'll basically keep out of it, mm. and he said in front of a witness. Mm. So at that point, the, his office pulled Glenn back a little bit off the case. Nevertheless, the Turnbulls were continuing to clear, so the investigations proceeded. Um, and they were, you know, in turn, in turn um, prosecuted and, and found guilty and fined, etc. Now, two years after uh, Glenn and Ian last spoke, um, Glenn Turner was on his way to a completely unrelated inspection in the area with a colleague, a, a man called Robert Strange, who was kind of new. Um, and uh, they, just, they were passing down the road that went along the side of the turn properties when their eye were, eyes were caught by the sight of literally flaming beacons. So the Turnbulls allegedly had been um, pushing endangered vegetation uh, raking it into piles and setting it on fire. So they're literally, you know, beacons to catch the eye. Mm. The two men stopped to have a look, um, take some photographs. Uh, and unfortunately, at that moment, one of the Turnbull employees saw their ute, recognised it and um, rang Ian Turnbull and said, you know, Glenn Turner's in the neighbourhood. Um, and Ian Turnbull um, put down what he was doing. He got in his car. He started driving towards the site. He stopped the car. He took the... 22 out of the tray at the back, put it on the, on the seat next to him, and he went to the site where he uh, proceeded to callously and mm. uh, cold-bloodedly kill Glenn Turner. Mm. And I think that one of the things that your book reveals to me instantly was that I had, and I think a lot of people, when they were aware of this as a news story, you assume that okay, there's been an altercation, there's been a, you know, in the heat of the moment, an argument, a gun's been produced and that somebody's been, been shot. But what's really, one of the really striking things about this story is that scene that you, and you paint it vividly of, you know, up to 40 minutes of a sort of a, almost a cat and mouse game around the, around the ute where he's, Ian Turnbull's shot, uh, Glenn Turner once, then twice, and mm. then there's been a you know continuing conversation, and I, before he he finally, you know, finally shoots the man, it is Glenn dead. Now, you, you just lead us through that. Yeah, look, I don't like to dwell on it too much, Christine, partly because oh, okay, you know, well, it's it's a really violent scene. Yes, and um, you know, I felt really deeply that Glenn Turner was a victim of this, and he. Mm. His privacy, like even the privacy of his death, was mm. something to tread carefully. Now, I did depict it in the book, and it, mm. you know, um, it was it was just a really awful scene. And so, Ian yes. Symbol was um, very deliberate in his actions. And this is in fact, this is you know two unarmed men, and it was twilight. They were yes. in absolutely middle of nowhere in in the countryside. There's no phone signal anyway, um, and. Robert Strange was actually a former policeman mm. and he was reduced to the status of just this completely helpless bystander. I think this is this is just so distressing. Mm. He couldn't do anything. He just kept on saying, please, sir, put the gun down. We're unarmed. We've got families. We need to go home. Just please let me get um, some medical help. And, um, 
you know, there was nothing to do. Turnbull was mm. resolved on this. Um, mm. He would later be defended in court under the idea that he'd having some kind of, you know, dissociative brain snap, you know, mm. it was, it was in, in, in the grip of a kind of mental disorder at that moment. Um, but Robert Strange testified that he wasn't. He was very, very deliberate. And I think that's that's what I, yeah, and I, I take your point that when somebody's, certainly when somebody's died, you don't want to make it seem like a, a some sort of horror movie. But I think it's, it's, it is important to recognise that this wasn't what it sounded like. There was more in that there was just a extended period where, as you said, that there were three men in a, on a lonely road and for for an extended period alone where it was clear that I mean it was it there's something awful was unfolding it wasn't a sudden um you know the, an act what what I suppose they call crimes of passion or crimes of anger you know this was a a very intense thing and as you I think you you, you talk about in the book that the um that Ray sorry strange sorry strange. Robert Strange yeah. I mean, he's never really recovered from that experience, has he, that the, in terms no. of the trauma of, no. of being present? He was very messed up, but he's, he's, he's much better now. He's a very resilient uh, person, I think. Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's good to hear. Oh. Now, take me to, just from a, and from a writer's perspective, so you have heard this story. At what point did you think, there's some, uh, what, at what point did your writer's ear go on? At what point did you think, yeah. I want to investigate this further. Well, yeah, the, the, the murder, I should probably just say to the people watching, the murder is um, just one element of this. Oh, and story. that's where we're going to go. Trust oh, no, me. I, don't, I don't mean to be diminishing it because it is a very, and it's a very powerful and compelling part of it. But um, what I saw was that there was obviously going to be a whole story behind these two men meeting, mm. having this terrible mm. confrontation. Um, and, of course, you know, in a way, uh, as a writer, I'm a bit of a pattern maker. I like to mm. look at patterns and see what mm. and, and sort things out. And so rather crudely, I, I just saw that this was in, in a way a kind of an allegory. So on the one hand, we have the the kind of the, the man of the land. Yes. You know, and he was quite a classic type of man of yes. the land. You know, the full, you know, the letterbox mouth and the, you know, the old jumpers and all that stuff. Um, and he's a man of development and he's going to, clear the endangered species, it's, nothing's going to stop him getting what he wants, that he's that mm. type. And I felt that that was a very old type, mm. a front yemp type, a colonial mm. type that we've known in this of country. Of that it's colonial very, mythology. Yeah, that we and have. there he was in 2014 with a gun, you know, getting mm. what he wanted. Um, and on the other hand, there was Glenn Turner, who, while not being an absolute manic greenie, I, I think mm. he was perhaps misinterpreted as being some kind of activist, mm. He was a man who loved the land and he, you know, he was um, revegetating the, his own property um, and he had come through the work to really appreciate the ecologies that he was um, charged with protecting. Um, and he stood for the part of Australia which loves land and loves our land, not the European version that we've mm. here, but the, the native, um, mm. genuinely Australian land. And I was curious about what had brought these two men into being. I mean, they're not inevitable. Mm. Um, what was the story between these two positions and what had brought them in the person of these two men who ultimately were both destroyed by this? Mm. Was this and that's, and where, what, was, what was happening here? And that's one of the things that strikes me about the book that you do so well. I mean, it'd be very easy and indeed we'll get to how the media, some of the media treated this, this case, but what you, it would have been very easy to sort of reduce it to very simple binaries, wouldn't it? Of the sort of yeah. greeny versus farmer or development versus um, environmental uh, conservation, um, bad guy versus good guy. But what I think you achieve and remarkably and very, and, almost from the outset is this recognition that there is a very complex history that's gone on and indeed thinking it like thinking of though thinking of the story through those um lenses that I just put that's really a very recent way to see things that we've had multiple sort of shifts over the years haven't we about how we've grappled with what we do with this relatively newly settled land yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, and I was really struck particularly by, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see this, this book 
taught because I liked the, I, I loved the way you took it right back to some of the um, attitudes to the land that arrived here with yes. the early settlers, that they yes. came here. Very Tell right. us about that, about, you know, that, 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 that they had, many of these people had lost land and wanted to grab more. Yeah, look, Christine, I went completely berserk when I was preparing this. I can imagine. I just got, I didn't get lost, but I, I just plunged backwards in time. Mm. And so I, I realised, first of all, that the absolute tragedy of the, the murder of Glenn Turner was just one step in a whole mm. set of, murder, of tragedies that had already occurred and then, of course, continued to happen after that. Um, and I went back, I thought, well, where, do, where is this frontier mentality from? Where is this come from? Why do we have this attitude to land? Why did Ian Turnbull feel that he could do whatever mm. he wanted on that land? Where does that attitude come from? And I found, of course, that it, it actually had its roots back in um, the philosophy of the 17th and 18th mm. century. So the, the people like John Locke, Tom Paine, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, they were all people who formed the culture that was brought to Australia, to this continent on the other side of the world. But their ideas were extremely formative and still stay with us. So they were talking about if you take a piece of land and you use it, then what's your entitlement? Do you just mm. get the fruit of your labours, you know, that you, you've used your, la your labour and your sweat and you get what that gives you, or do you actually get kind of some mystical title to the land? Where does God fit into this? God gave us the land to use according to the Bible. So people, in the, the, even the time of the Enlightenment and the colonial project in Australia, mm. they were still believing it up to a point that God had given us this divine responsibility and this, these bounties. So that's all part of why someone like Turnbull might sit there going, you come here and you tell me what to do, and I, you know, who do you think you are? Um, and I ended up also thinking about who were the people who first arrived to, and, you know, to stage this. And they were often Celtic people. So the Irish and the Scots had been themselves kicked off their land by the British being colonial in Scotland and Ireland. And so these people themselves had first of all learned that land is very impermanent, that you can mm. lose it, but also that land was everything. So in the British Empire, until, you know, only 100 years ago, you had nothing unless you owned property so you needed to own land in order to have mm. it. if you didn't have land you had no no civic you know citizenry rights at all so for uh, someone who'd been kicked off their land in scotland during the clearances you could come here you could take it and if you take it you had everything it had such an emotional power to the spat story of how this country was settled when you realised it wasn't just we, we, we are told, you know, we hear so often about the convict story and the early settlers, and, but we don't hear that, that mm. what they brought with them in terms of trauma and expectation. Yeah, you know, and you capture that. As well. and, mm. and they came here and, of course, the first thing they had to do was reckon with the fact that the land was occupied. Yes. You know, um, and so really one of the foundational tragedies that I, I, found, I found in the story was, of course, the dispossession and massacring of First Nations people in that country, and it was a frontier war area. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were several attested massacres not far from Crockett. Crock Crock yes. And, of course, that was not done by robots. It was done by these men who had probably had completely peaceful backgrounds back in mm. the They might have been clerks in Birmingham. Mm. You know, they might have done anything. But there they are with the blood on their hands. This mm. is the way it was here. And um, they what, had... a century or more later, you have you you picture those, that that the that visage, that face, that the eyes, the the trauma that they hold. Yeah. And you paint that idea of how that's you know, passed on in a way down the generations. If you have, if you, what you have seen and what you have now not talking about, the, 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 yeah. the things that you've seen. Repression. And yes. the mentality that is a weird byproduct of that repression of guilt mm. and trauma. So rather than feeling vulnerable, um, you know, perhaps it's a, a fairly masculine reaction. There are a lot of men in this. In this, a story. lot of men. Um, and um, but to to throw it outwards, you know, to blame someone else for your mm. sense of wrongness. You've done something wrong. Something's wrong. You, you feel that um, you have committed a wrong, and mm. it's easier to displace that. So they would blame the black people, you know, and say them they're attacking us, you know, mm. or the land is so tough, you know, we have to whack it and smash it and, you know, slice it and, and haul it and lug it and set it on fire. 
Because and that's another thing. We'll stop. I, I'll stop you there to say. So that's another thing that you paint very vividly is that this was not. We we look there. There's a lot of imagery in our colonial history as it's taught of you know the sort of bucolic, you know, farming. I think you painted the farmers looking out to the to the horizon and lots of golden wheat fields swaying. But it's it was brutal, um, and and a lot of their farming methods were completely, you know, useless. On yeah. the sort of in the sort of environment that they found themselves, and I really like my my heart goes out. This is not a book in any way mm. bashing farmers. Mm. Farmers have worked so hard, and they you know they make our food, they do all of our stuff, they develop the country, they've brought prosperity and wealth, and they've established families and communities. But they have often been told to do things which ultimately were a mistake. And well, I think you. I'm sorry to interrupt you, and I'll. I'll I think you you. Um, you make that point about how there was a period where you were expected to clear the land or you could lose it. Well, if Glenn Turner had been a compliance officer when Ian Turnbull was born in the 1930s, he'd have been turning up saying, kill the wallabies, poison the, the koalas, put up more fences, cut down more trees. So exactly. Very dramatically since then. And, and a lot of farmers have just done what they were told and then been blamed for the consequences. Hmm. And I think really that you know the the blame, if you want to think of it like that, is in our our whole attitude, the system that this country was here to be used, you know, mm. it was here for using. And I think that's one of the things that I think I found quite powerful, as I said, rather than sort of revert to some sort of black white, you know, goodbye guy, bad guy um, imagery. You 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 did at times, you know, you there were times where you sort of, if not evoked sympathy for um, Ian Turnbull. You certainly explained that this wasn't some, you know, this person didn't pop out of nowhere um, and just suddenly decided he was going to wreak havoc on the land, that there was a, a good history of, you know, that had created the, not, and not just this man. There will, there's, there'll be others who, you know, who are, obviously see the land the same way. For good reason. Yeah. And look, Ian Turnbull, I mean, he had his particular circumstances. For, for example, he was very old and he mm. felt he was, you know, really dying. He felt he was on his way out. He was a, in a great hurry to establish his family mm. and, and to do what he had to do. But he was absolutely also a product. And his community is made up of other individuals who all affect each other. And I write in the book, I found a fantastic body of scholarly work, which is about farmers' attitudes to each other, to community, to yes. environmental law, to environmental harm, and how there's very, very kind of granular understandings about, well, if your spray kind of comes over the, drifts over to onto my property, and accidentally poisons my crop out, that might be a mistake. You know, we'll move on. But if you're a new person, I might not forgive you. If you've been poaching on my land, maybe, maybe not. Um, you know, there are different kind of understandings of what harm was and what uh, what serious harm was. And a lot of farmers would say, well, just pushing a couple of trees. It's not like, you know, abusing a woman. Um, you know, so their ideas of, of what a crime is and what mm. a transgression are, you know, are very particular. Yeah. Um, and that, that's a community understanding. And also, mm -hmm. I mean, I should say, um, Cropper Creek is a very typical, very small community, very tightly bonded. Um, and so what one person might be doing, they might be thinking, well, you're doing it, I might do that. You, know? you very much got that sense that there was, you know, and people were aware of, mm. you know, it, it, I think we hear if we live in a city environment, um, you think that the laws are there and, okay, that's the law, so you play by the rules. There's but no you, not if you're in the middle of nowhere, There's you know. No nowhere. And that was what, what Glenn Turner was doing, but he was trying to cover a huge amount of territory mm. and, you know, and that there's just ways and means. And I've got to say that I, I discovered rather late, I thought it was interesting that just before um, the murder, um, a very wealthy landowner and property developer, the biggest wheat grower in Australia, had just sold some land mm. he had converted from cropping to, from grazing to cropping for a huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there were some allegations that his clearing had not all been, you know, uh, perfectly legal. Um, they were not, they were not prosecuted. Um, but so I think Turnbull would have seen that. He would have read that about that in the paper, reading the land newspaper, and he would have thought, that could be me. Mm. That's me. I'm going to be. I'm going to be that big guy. Mm. And, and what would he think was going to stop mm. him? Just that. 
And I think that you um, you make the point that um, th there, there was that development mentality where it was almost a bit of a gamble. You knew you might put some money aside because there might be a court mm -hmm. case, but but yeah. the payoff if you if you got away with it was so big. Yeah, millions of dollars to be made. You might yeah. be fined a few hundred thousand. There's the lawyer, but you might make millions. Mm. Yeah. Very, very worth making that taking that risk I guess if you're a Turnbull mm, mm. but and I'll, I'll ask you to sort of read a little bit in a moment but I should make the point um as we move through that yes in some cases it was a few trees but the sheer scale of what you described mm. that was going on I mean and when you describe that the way you they push trees I didn't realize that was the turn of phrase but if that it was yeah. I mean it was quite devastating you could imagine those environmental officers um, watching this, knowing that it could go on for months and months and months before the legal system caught up. Yeah. And, and there were thousands of trees being. Yes, uh, yes, literally thousands. At one point, they were, the Turnbulls were found guilty of um, pushing 3,000 trees mm. um, and you know, many more, possibly. Um, and uh, the, it's not just the trees either. Mm. It's so, um, Glenn was a, a, accompanied in most of his inspections by a really lovely man, Chris Nadolny, who's an ecologist, who was the, the consulting ecologist who could actually look very specifically at the species. And he could see lots of things. He could see endangered birds. He could see koala, koala scat. You know, he could see a whole network of, of, of a biodiversity yeah. community, which was all going to be um, pulverized under the, the, the dozers. Um, and you know, through looking at the eco ecological reality of this, you know, the very specifics of this place and exactly what species they have, you really understand that these things, it's not even just about what happens on those blocks because everything pushes out. So when the, the blocks of the Turnbull family were being cleared, their neighbour, a farmer, she was getting koalas running oh. off their property because everything spills out, you know. Mm. Um, they, were, they were burning vegetation on the Turnbull's property her property nearly caught fire. Um, you know, there's edge effect where vegetation mm. left over on the side gets starts becoming dry and more flammable, even if it's across the road, you know. Mm. So there's all of that. There's the, the cor wildlife corridors which are destroyed, you know, um, and there's all these different um, consequences of clearing, which, you know, as one of the judges in the land environment court said, you can't really restore that, you know, you mm. can't measure it and you can't restore it. Um, so the, the kind of the, the legal system that comes into play when finally a prosecution is mounted, um, that can address a whole lot of things, but doesn't really go to the, the heart of it, which is that an, an irreplaceable community is lost. Mm. And on those blocks, you know, there was really special stuff and there were certainly koalas mm. Mm. and there were no koalas left. No, and I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's important to remind ourselves that the, the cute and fluffy things are, you know, cute and fluffy, but there's also... Mm -hmm. Plenty of other stuff well, that we're going to see. You know, little yes. things, and insects and things live in the trees and all of yes. that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I must the, the the number of times was I read the book that I I found myself thinking of the Great Barrier Reef for similar, yeah, you know, for similar reasons that it sprang to mind. That, yeah, once it's gone, once chunks of it are gone, it's very hard to, mm. you know, no matter what we're told, it's very hard to repatriate something like yeah. that and, and a, a complex ecosystem. And look, I don't want to, you know, guide your <laughs> guide your discussion, but I, I really am you can. You're the author. Use this now. This opportunity to speak about also the kind of the political and legal mm. story that is behind this. So there was yes. no accident that these laws were there, or will, you know, shortly after change to to allow much, you know, kind of greater self assessment by farmers, uh, and it really re resulting very inevitably in a huge increase in clearing, mm. um, absolutely massive. Because there's a whole um, there's a whole issue with the way the laws are framed, the way mm. they're formed and influenced by you know by different stakeholders, mm. and you know and the, then behind that of course the, the political landscape, which I had ah. to mostly keep out of the book for for you know for for caution and, and legal reasons and all that. But um, you know there's it's not just some kind of out there in the remote world, mm. kind of on some bush block situation. This is actually about the way we govern and administrate this country. Well, so, it's worth noting for sure that um, that somebody like an Ian Turnbull would have been hearing regularly 
um, politicians making speeches, politics, politicians of a certain, you know, bent, making speeches that, you know, absolutely these farm, farmers had to be doing exactly what they're doing and they're the, you know, they're, they're upholding the nation's economy and things like that. I mean, I know the politicians that we're referring to and, and I think one of the, one of the sad things that you capture is, uh, one of the obscene things really that you capture is that, you know, when Glenn Turner died, there were, you know, a few people certainly happy to sort of say that, you know, to turn this story around to saying that, um, well, this is what a farm has been driven to, as if somehow, yeah. you know, it was understandable what happened because. Well, they you know, were very quick to say that actually. Yes. They were, they were ready to go. So, um, you know, Immediately, there was commentary about this is what you get. The laws are the fault. The, the, the laws are too complicated. They push farmers too hard. It's unreasonable. Look, they you know they break a man like Ian Turnbull, mm. a strong man, and he's broken under the pressure of these and look what he's been forced to do. Mm. Which is I, really, you know, as you say, kind of obscene. Um, well, it's obscene when you think yeah. that in the mean, particularly in when in the meantime you have a, you know, a, a man who had two children. You know, Glenn Turner, who had a wife and two children who had died and who was essentially just a government officer. I mean, this wasn't, yeah. you know, as you said, he wasn't some, you know, somebody who was trespassing or doing anything wrong. He was doing his job. Yeah. He was just doing his job. Yes. And, and very well. Um, but, yes, these, these kind of narratives that are, are ready to be, to be conjured into being as soon as anything, you know, sparks them off. Mm. And, mm. and used. I mean, I think those that case was very cynically used by certain parties to, to promote a change to the laws, which did indeed occur um, not long after. Um, and yeah, I mean, they they, they were they were irresponsible people. I think. Mm. Mm. Very yeah. much so. Um, sorry, I've just oh, no. Yeah, there you are. I just I thought I'd lost you. So let's go back and let's um, um and let's go back to the human people involved the uh, and and I'll, I'll ask you Kate to read that 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 piece about you know when there was an altercation between Glenn and and Ian Turnbull yeah, sure I'll try and read it a bit quickly it's about two pages long. we have lots of time you go ahead okay, so this is um this is about the third time that Ian Turnbull and Glenn Turner met and they, they'd only met a handful of times so it's a very long way out from where it, Glenn Turner was working down to Grubber Creek it's a bit of a drive um, so this is about a, a, an encounter which didn't go very well the third time Ian Turnbull and Glenn Turner met was at the gate of Strathdoon this is one of the properties with Chris Nadolny that day in late June 2012 when Turnbull explained his interest in conversion from grazing to crops he said it's the you know the last of the black soil it's got to have a crop on it the farmer was still acting as spokesperson for his son and grandson, who were the actual owners of the box. He said that they were clearing because it was prime agricultural land, but Turner was only interested in the compliance issues. By doing more clearing, he warned, you're only making the same a situation more serious. The OEH, that's the Office of Environment and Heritage, was considering recommending that remediation, restoring the ecology, be undertaken for the earlier clearing. Turner added that it wouldn't have to be when the crop was already planted. They'd be allowed to get that harvest in first. The OEH wouldn't make them grow it up. He thought he was being reassuring. Turnbull didn't enjoy being granted permission to reap his crop. He didn't like hearing that the investigation wasn't going away or that trees might have to be replanted. The OEH was kindly not going to rip up his crop. He looked at Turner from under his thick brows with a flash of anger that unnerved Nadolny. If you've got any respect for your life, he said, according to Turner, you won't. Threatening state officers incurs a serious penalty, up to several years jail. Turner recorded in his notebook his response. I interpret that as a threat, and if you continue to threaten me, the police will become involved. I'm an old man, Turnbull fired back. I don't care. I can do anything I want. Now things grew heated. Turnbull wanted to know who'd snitched on him. Nadolny grew fearful for their informant. Turnbull seemed dangerous. Turner, undeterred showed Turnbull his notebook and the information given by the anonymous caller. He spoke frankly to the old man, warning he knew of a similar case. That individual had been for, fined $400,000 and had the land locked up for 15 years until the trees grew back. Beside him, Nadolny nodded, and Chris is a very slight and you know, quiet man. You'd better stop this now, he said earnestly. This is going to be terrible for you. 
You'll dig yourself into a hole and never get out. Turnbull began to protest, quiet and only pressed on. He didn't usually speak up to landholders, leaving that to the investigators, but he had an urgent sense of foreboding. I've seen cases like this, he interrupted, where people are absolutely destroyed. The OEH men knew that many local landowners were watching what might happen to the Turnbulls and even risk averse OEH lawyers now considered this a certain prosecution. It was going to be bad. The old man shook them off irritably, talking again of regrowth. The distinction between regrowth and remnant was crucial. Not only thought that perhaps the farmer had misunderstood the difference, but he persisted. Turnbull was clearing Brigalow, which was an endangered ecological community. Turner pulled out an aerial photograph taken 20 years earlier on which he'd marked the new clearing. This is part of the evidence I've used, he said steadily, to form the opinion that the trees were remnant. It looked like about 200 hectares of protected endangered scrub, brigolo and other species had been cleared. Could Turnbull show them the supposed regrowth vegetation, Turner asked. Turnbull grew enraged. I had to pay the government a quarter of a million dollars in taxes, he snarled, according to Turner's notebook. And you come here to tell me what I can and can't do. I'm not here to tell you what to do, Turner replied, but there are rules set up by the New South Wales government that you are required to follow. Turnbull responded that if Turner wanted to end a strategy, he would have to go over the gate with his authorization papers. Could Turner come and meet Corey, the actual owner of the property in town? Striding away, he took out his phone and called his lawyer, Roger Butler, to arrange the meeting in the Moray Chambers. But there was only a voicemail saying the office was closed for lunch. Turnbull dug in. The OEH would have to send all correspondence to Colin Butler. And he told the boys, Grant and Corrie, not to take any registered mail. Turner said he'd try Butler again in the afternoon. Then Turnbull left, driving off south down County Boundary Road in his white ute as the dust lifted behind him and Turner and Nadolny watched in silence. So it's, it was, you know, not going well. <laughs> And it's so, you have to remind yourself, although you don't really have to remind it because you, you paint it so well, but it's, it's just a different world. I mean, we, I think Australians like to think of themselves as outdoorsy, you know, independent people. We're told, you know, we're people of the bush and the, of the land and, you know, all that sort of thing. But really, we're city dwellers, most of us. And, I mean, I know that area reasonably well. I have um, extended family who are on a, um, on a cotton farm that we it, we wore near, near Maury. So we drive through Maury. And I, I, you know, it's worth reminding yourself, this is, this is frontier in some ways. If you get into trouble in some of these areas, you're a long way from, yeah. And you're, you know, you don't have a phone signal as they didn't that night. So mm. I think that's, that's a real, that scene that you paint there, you know, as you said, it's not going well, but it's also reminds us that when somebody like an Ian Turnbull decides this is what he's going to do, you know, it, you don't have backup, you know, it's a, it takes a long time to get anything in, in place to stop him. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, can I ask you, did you ever come to a view, especially that, you know, the night, you know, by that night when Ian Turnbull did what he did and then turned around and went home, he, he left them the, the, the scene of the shooting and went home and sat in his lounge chair at home. He obviously knew what was going to happen. He'd said, you can call the police. Um, hmm. He later depicted himself um, almost as a, uh, uh, not a terrorist, what's the word? Somebody who has dropped a bomb in to see, to make change. Yeah. Um, did you form a view in the end? What, what was his state of mind personally, did you, did you think? Did you, did you ever come to understand it? Well, I think, you know, I, I want to speak to Chris Nadolny, who had been present at a lot of these encounters, and he said that Turnbull had... Um, made a threat to Glenn that wasn't reported. He, after he'd said, if you value life, you know, you won't make me grab it. He'd gone on to make this kind of threat slash joke. And Chris said he never could work out what it was. Was it a mm. joke? And he said, I could kill you. I could kill you with one shot. And I'd call it trespass. I'd call it manslaughter. Mm. I'd say you were trespassing. And I'd get bailed. And, um, you know, and I'd be convicted of manslaughter. I'd get bailed up to the North Shore in Sydney and I'd get manslaughter, you know. And there was definitely um, 
the result of um, what he did was that immediately all investigations, both state and federal into in compliance issues were frozen. Mm. No, no officers were sent out into the field for some time. And there was um, a suggestion that the OEH should just drop the stuff against Turnbull because he was being promoted as a martyr to the laws. And mm. how bad would it look if they then went and prosecuted this man who'd already been broken to this point, et cetera. And um, it, was, it was Glenn's colleagues, including Chris, who pushed back and said, no, you have to complete the prosecution. You can't back off. That would send a terrible signal. Um, and we have the evidence. It wasn't just, it wasn't malicious, but they had the evidence to mount it. So Turnbull actually had quite rational reasons. Mm. It was just extremely weird because it was two years since he'd seen Glenn Turner, but he had apparently developed this fixation. Turner was the problem. Um, Turner was the was the obstacle and I thought in I have a line in the book which is from the 1840s where someone used to say shoot the pests and manure the ground with them and it was that attitude about just just get rid of whatever's in your way mm. shoot it down and you know whether he got carried away whether it was just like he just kind of went right that's it but he'd been making threats and jokes about mm. digging a hole to bury a digging hole. graves digging graves and mm. You know, that might have been, as Chris said, it might have been his way of just kind of letting it off, you know, um, or trying out a little idea and seeing how it went down. Mm. So I don't think anyone can really know. The man died in prison, at, you know, and um, he was convicted in ultimately of murder. So the, the jury did not accept that he had been in, in mental impairment. They accepted that he had killed Glenn Turner and it was a murder charge and he was convicted for 35 years for that. Now, I'd like to say, or I'd like to think that, you know, so the, the bad guy, we'll say the bad guy, has gone to jail, justice has uh, prevailed. But unfortunately, has anything changed in terms of clearing? Well, the clearing has increased hugely. Now, there's not even that many figures on this, and there are now not very many compliance officers or investigative mm. officers to observe it. Um, and the laws were changed to allow um, self, farmers basically to self-assess whether they feel that their, their scrub is in, full of endangered species or not. And I think the idea is basically that they take the, they take the chance and then, like, you know, putting in your own tax return kind of, and then you might be ordered mm. and caught out. So, you, you know, the, the idea is that you do the right thing. But there's not that much support to find uh, any infringements. Um, and I know that in one year, something like three times the area of Greater Melbourne was cleared in the Moree district alone. Uh, there is an apocalypse of mm. biodiversity loss going on up mm. there. And this is not um, kind of regrowth crappy vegetarian, uh, European vegetation. This is endangered species, remnant ancient rainforest, dry rainforest mm. vegetation. It's it really important stuff. It's not just pretty to look at. It's yes. really important for ecology um, and the health of everything, including the soil that the farmers are then going to use. And my my farmer friend up there, she said, look, they're even taking trees out of the waterways now. They're filling in the dams. They're so mm -hmm. desperate to, to get that valuable land. Um, and, you know, where that takes us, I don't know. Mm. There's not a lot left. Mm. Um, they can get rid of a lot of what there is left. And there's no sign at the moment that those laws are going to be changed anywhere. Mm. So, you know, ultimately the Turnbulls have continued to crop those mm. properties. They're now for sale. One of them is now for sale. But um, I have to be very careful how I speak about it. But they, they were convicted twice of um, illegal clearing and uh, those properties um, have been cropped since then. Mm, mm. It's worth pointing out that, um, and you say this in your book, that it's, you know, there are plenty of farmers doing yeah, the right absolutely. thing. We're not yeah. saying that farmers are sort of, you know, as mm. a whole going out and doing bad things. In fact, there was a quote, I think you quoted somebody saying it's, a, what was it, a small group yeah, who are, yeah, are repeatedly are repeated offenders, but you can do, they can do an enormous amount of damage. And I thought think it's also interesting um, that what we have seen. I mean, that one of the Turner sons, you know, Roger, who went on to sell those properties, and what we're seeing is, you know, they're sold to these big conglomerates. Yeah, you know, yeah. and that disturbs me. That, investment funds. Yes, some of them, you know international some of them local but the, yes they're, they're just they're huge funds that can buy up huge amounts of property yeah 
And it feels like we're almost just at a point of just stripping things out and stripping things out. And well, as you know, there's a, I, 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 you know, referred to Rachel Carson, you know, this mm. old 60s and kind of environment writer. And she talks about landscapes made the way an engineer would make them. And that's basically what these landscapes have become. They're like spreadsheets. They're mm. like little screens. They're incredibly smooth and homogenous. Mm. There's no variety. They're, they're functional landscapes, unfortunately. You know, uh, not only is that a shame, if you like anything other than in highly industrial landscapes, but they're also on a law of diminishing returns. They become yes. less and less productive. You have to put more and more chemicals into those landscapes yes. to prop them up. Um, and there is, of course, a, a movement for regenerative agriculture. And ironically enough, Ian Tendall's own brother-in-law is a, a, a star of the regenerative farming <laughs> Um, movement and he um, you know takes people around and shows off his wonderful farm which he mm -hmm. you know, he still he has cleared but um, he does much gentler practices which is more about restoring soil mm. health and so, so mm. that industrial that industrial model is very efficient and productive it is mm. that's why we have it it's not just for you know for fun but um, it's it's always going to be less and less possible be, and you have to clear more and more and more in order to yes. get the land that's not yet wrecked and this is that frontier mentality that there's always a permanent frontier you can push on and we've been using that mentality since you know 1788 this is insane this is a mm. finite continent mm. and mm. eventually you run out of places to to go Yes, absolutely. Um, I want to uh, remind everybody that we are, in fact, the questions are open in the chat. Um, I'm not at sure if anyone has put in a question because I am so technologically... <laughs> I can see them. Because I am very more than happy because to continue asking questions and I have so many questions about the, the process of writing this book, Kate, because it really is... Um, as somebody who, you know, sort of has worked a lot in the nonfiction um, genre and as a journalist, um, reading this book and just looking at the, you know, dense, uh, you know, resources and, and, and that you cite in the back, you, you, nine how much pages, nine yes. pages of bibliography. <laughs> it was it's it was quite a feat. I I it, I just com commend it because the amount of research that has gone into this book, and as I said, into the history of, you know, of how our our continent's been developed is worthwhile mm -hmm. in itself. But to then weave this human story through it. Um, yeah, is quite an accomplishment. Um, can you tell me? Did you ever get? Did you ever get halfway in and go, "What am I doing?" What am I doing? Well, look at me. I'm only 23. <laughs> <laughs> I look like a 49 year old woman, very tired. Um, it was so much work, Christine. It was mm. so much work. Um, it's been about three and a half years, and I, I am a very, I'm a very good, you know, diligent person so I, I kind of launched into a massive research thing it was like doing three PhDs fortunately mm. my partner is a is a, a, a member of the faculty of a university so I kind of poach his login <laughs> and use his university <laughs> library and and run a muck in their resources because otherwise I don't know how I would have done it mm. um, and I just read and read and read and read and read and read and of course I had to work out things like how is I going to keep track of my sources and, yes. and so on and um, also the, the the Turnbull Turner story itself. Um, I came on it very late, so yes. Um, so both of the main protagonists were deceased by the time I came. Anyway, is the trial the trials were over. There was only um, media reports and some court documents. But I didn't realise that even in an open court hearing, once it's concluded, like anyone can go along at the time, mm. but once it's concluded, it's very restricted what anyone can see. Yes, I had to apply and I was given partial access to some of the documentation. Mm. Uh, and out of that and kind of 100 million different newspaper reports, I, I pieced together these little tiny fragments to, mm. to build the story together. Um, inevitably, I'm sure I've missed things, but mm. I just had to get it all. And it was a, such a compelling story. I got, felt like I was on the, the hunt, you know. Yes. Which is very, you know, as you know, as a journalist, very yeah. you know, satisfying mm. feeling. Mm. But um, then I, I had to deal with it all. I, I wrote the whole thing in about four months or even less in this, you know, got to get it done. Um, and I had realised at the end uh, I had a book that was twice the length. It was, it was 180,000 words. 
beautifully written and all fully sourced. It was an immaculate piece of work, but just twice as long as it could possibly. <laughs> My editor didn't wobble valiantly, kind of oh. took it on, and then we've literally spent two and a half years editing it, adding new stuff, you know, chasing up leads, um, you know, fitting things, revising things, rearranging the structure. Yes. Like yes huge amount of work and and literally the last three months we're almost entirely devoted just to the bibliography and the, and the references and checking all that stuff well um, i would like to say to black ink um you know credit to them because yes. in this current environment particularly with publishing and media you know there isn't a lot of investment then Incre increasingly it's hard to get that time yes. to do the quality yes. editing that really makes a book yeah. Sing. I was blessed with Julia Kalamani. She was tireless. Mm. Yeah, she mm. drove me insane. <laughs> I was like, it's enough, Julia, stop. Yeah. I'm broken. But she, <laughs> went, she really believed that we could make it, you know, mm. really structured. And I, because of the subject as well, I really, really needed to get everything correct, you know. And yes, absolutely. The people involved and, you know, and because I'm dealing with very touchy and yes. legal issues, I, I had to get it very correct. Yeah. So it was a huge learning curve for me no absolutely and well you yes I, I expect to see this on some non-fiction prize lists but bef yeah, before I ramp up expectations I am aware that we have questions I'm sorry Yana I was looking at the wrong thing because that's the sort of facilitator I am <laughs> that's all right um yeah we'll go to some audience questions we've had quite a few come in so we'll get through um as many as we can um so off the back of what you were saying just before, um, Kate, when you were saying that the frontier is continually being pushed, uh, Teresa asked, do you think there is a finite dollar value of the land for economic gain? Mm. Well, uh, it keeps going up in some places. So the land that was the Turnbulls were um, converting uh, basically doubled in value. Uh, within a couple of years of, of them purchasing it through their actions and has continued, you know, the average price up there, I think, is now nearly $7,000 a hectare. Uh, yeah, which is huge. Um, of course, other places are degraded and they're losing their value. And, I mean, to see things as an economic entity is definitely a useful tool in lots of ways because you can see what we are, you know, what we're doing. But at the same time, it, it's so hard, and, you know, and it makes me think of when people say, what about if we put a, a price and we had to, um, to give reparation to First Nations people? How would we begin to evaluate it? How would we begin to afford it? Mm -hmm. And I think we can't measure what the cost is to the land that we've done mm -hmm. you know, by, by being there. Um, another question we had that came through was from Nathan and he asked if you were able to interview Ian Turnbull, Turnbull or his close family prior to his death. Uh, no. So, Nathan, no. I came onto the story um, after T Turnbull had died in, in jail. Uh, I don't believe he gave any interviews to anyone. Yeah. I did approach the family several times. So there's um, his son, Grant, who's one of the property owners, and his grandson, Corrie, and his wife, Donna, who own the other one. And also there's another son, Roger and I approached them all um, very, you know, um, cautiously uh, because I, I knew that this would be very difficult for them to to come to, and they they weren't able to feel comfortable to speak to anyone. Um, but very late in the day, a relative, um, not not one of those main people, but one of their relatives, did contact me, and he supplied me with his allegations about and, and questions about what he what had happened, which was really uh, illuminating. And some of that I included in the book. Um, with some caveats to, to, to put where I thought it belonged. Yeah, of course. Uh, but it was, it was um, great that they finally came through with some communication. I really appreciated it. Mm. Yeah. Um, we do have another question from Ruben, and he says he has only just finished reading Rick Morton's 100 Years of Dirt, and it seems like there might be a few common themes and threads between the two stories. Did Kate uncover any or many references to the Morton agricultural empire in her investigation into this story? Oh, thanks. Look, I haven't read Rick's book yet. Um, I, uh, I, I, stopped, <laughs> I stopped reading things to do with this story way back because I already had this massive book and I just could not afford to find anything else interesting. <laughs> I would want to be packing it because this is way too dangerous. So I, you know, I called it blank and I, um, but I would really like to read it. I have huge respect for Rick as a journalist and writer and um, 
I think there would be a lot of stuff in, in between. There's a, there is another family, which is a very prominent family out there towards we all where, where your family's got stuff, Christine, um, the Harris family, and they are a big presence in that landscape. Mm. I don't know the Mortons at all. I think from memory, just uh, that the Morton, the, most of the Morton property was uh, grazing really hard. Uh, not yet, yeah, not not pastoral, so I'd probably yeah. a little further out, but that's yeah. I off feel the top like of my head. You know, there's the cotton stuff and then there's yes. that. And at one point someone said, oh, my gosh, you're going to write about the water stuff, you know, the water irrigation things. I'm like, God, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't make me get stuck in that. I'll never get out of there. Yeah. You know, five volumes of, of stuff. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but thank you for the question. I've got a remix book. <laughs> um, I will move to um, Toby's question and he says are we witnessing a tragedy of the commons as self-interested farmers deplete the resources of the land destroying it for future generations and if so should the private property rights conservation move from John Locke towards the work of Garrett Hardin and Eleanor Ostrom which I think has to do with overpopulation Oh, yeah, yeah, the tragedy of the commons. Well, um, I think that is exactly it. I didn't even begin to get into that whole um, kind of concept, philosophical concept, but uh, I think this is the question that came at the heart. So when Glenn Turner and Ian Turnbull were speaking to each other over that farm gate, um, Turnbull was of the position, this is my land, I do what I want, you know. Glenn was representing, you know, unwittingly, but he was representing the perspective that actually there are horizontal, you know, um, limits as well. And that is our civic responsibility, our heritage responsibilities. So you may own, you know, technically speaking, the, the vegetation on that land, but you also own the consequences and responsibilities for it. Uh, and that is shared by all people in this country. And indeed, not even the people, it's shared by all the, all the life forms and those yet to come. Um, and what we're seeing is the devolution of private property into the absolute um, benchmark for, for all legal and political kind of framings, which is, uh, well, it, it's so naive, apart from anything else. It's so naive and it's so limited. And so I, I put quite a lot of space into the, in the book into discussing philosophies which try to extend those ideas. So the idea of... Um, um, what's it called? So Polly Higgins work about ecocide and what if nature has rights and what if people mm. who damage nature will be actually arraigned in courts in the future um, under uh, the crime of ecocide? And what about um, neighbourly bonds and what happens if you um, say spray out your property and your, your neighbour's stuff is damaged? What about these horizontal kind of threads which link everyone together? So I didn't, I had to cram this all in, but I compact it down. But I think you really, yeah, you've got right to the heart of it because I think that's what the question is in the middle of this book. Where, where, does, where, are, the, where, are, the, where are the boundaries? Can we even have them anymore? You know, something like that. I think this just goes to show how complex the book is and mm. how meaty it is as well. Oh, mm -hmm. Yes, it's, well, I tried to make it interesting, you know, to just touch this up with things that look simple and then find the interesting things that bond them and make connections between things that maybe mm. hadn't been connected before. For those here who haven't yet are yet to read it, I will again say I was so surprised that there were very big concepts that I still found myself up at night going, I just want to read a bit more. So you did, you managed to make it very compelling and readable. So yeah, I, I do congratulate you on that. Um, Kate, Yana, do you have more questions? In our um, two I have minutes. one more and then we might just end it there and it's one on um, a bit on the characters and it is a little bit meaty but I reckon it's a good one to finish on um, and Christine says Ian Turnbull would never have questioned his own motives or decisions so once he made the decision which he did completely premeditated he was never going to start accepting either responsibility or that his actions may be right his wife, Rabina, in her ever dutiful, unquestioning, submissive role, was the only person who could have altered his behaviour or decision-making process. Christine thinks Rabina was the only person who could have instituted change and she was un either unable or unwilling. It is clear from her response with passing on everyone's well wishes to Ian in jail that she never questioned the blame. Am I alone in blaming Rabina for never questioning him? Oh, well, that is so interesting. Oh, yeah. I would have loved to have more of that 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 female perspective. I said it is yeah. a very male book. Um, and the women in the story are mostly reduced to witnesses and, and testifiers. Yes, Rubina, um, look, she's an elderly woman and, and like her husband, I mean, she's the, the product of 
you know, her times and her place. And as I say, a very small and conservative community. She was extremely loyal to her, her husband and yes, never faltered. I, I, I couldn't possibly speculate on what she might or might not have said, but she was stalwart. Um, and um, I, I think it must be a terrible tragedy to her because what happened in the end with the family, mm. and this is a bit, this is a bit kind of, uh, you know, tabloid, I guess, but the family itself has, has discovered had this tremendously um, story worthy kind of biblical implosion after mm. um, the, the crime and their father's conviction. And so the two of the four Turnbull brothers um, really turned on each other and the mother was caught in between and I found it like the story of Cain and Abel and there's the good son who ends up with the father with the, with the mother um, and the other son who was the golden boy who's cast out and in the Turnbull case it literally went to court where one of the brothers the, the, the kind of estranged one um, he, he had a, a road that he was using ripped up by his brother with a tractor that literally got a ripper and ripped that, that road so he could not pass down it anymore and Roger Turnbull this is it testified attested in court so I can say it he took a spray rig and sprayed along the side of his mother's property and poisoned her crop in retaliation this is it's Steinbeck it's yeah. it's it's you know it's bitter and I just found that that was you know a sign of yeah, the, the the last part of the tragedy. Well, not even the last, but you know, the further tragedies that mm -hmm. sort of keep cascading out of this. And to this day, I think there's still damage unfolding. Mm -hmm. And I, my heart just goes out to the, everyone involved in this horrible story, really. And I might just jump in and just add, make the observation from as somebody who did a, a bit of work or, uh, back in the day as a journalist out in these remote areas. I think I, I resist holding women to account for the sins of, of the men because this is a brutal land and if a, a brutal isolation. And I think a lot of the women who lived there, it would be very difficult to speak up mm -hmm. in, in these environments. Um, you know, it's, it's a difficult thing coming from that conservative background as it is, but you also just, it's, you know, you learn early that, the, the, the man of the land is not to be yeah. disagreed with, I think. I'd just like to, to maybe close by with a shout out to two or well, to three women who do appear in the book. And there's the farmer, Elaine Anderson, who was a witness and he stood up to, to the people in her community who were doing illegal land from a huge risk for herself. And also um, Glenn's partner, Alison McKenzie and sister, Fran Pierce, who have both been really strong and spoken up and continue to be ad act activists and advocates. Um, to, for Glenn's legacy and also the, you know, the, the cause of protecting wildlife and, and biodiversity. And they've been able to really stand their ground. And I think they, um, yeah, they're, they're strong female presences in the book, even though they've got a small role. Yeah. So All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Kate and Christine. I think we'll have to wrap it up there because we have gone a bit over and it seems like we couldn't be here forever. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> That's a nice <laughs> note to end on. Thank you. So thank I you so will. Much quickly unmute everyone and we can give a quick round of applause if everyone would like to unmute if i'm that good at technology it might work so you can purchase a copy of the witch road at avid reader online um, and thank you again kate and christine everyone have a great night yes thank, thank you. you thanks christine bye thank you